that everyone really does have to either through lived experience or through some sort of primary education um, has to get to, to seeing Bitcoin as money. Um, some people might get there from reading the Bitcoin standard or the bullish case for Bitcoin or America, the Bitcoin dream, inventing Bitcoin. Others will do it because their currency is falling apart and it's A or B. And the difference in choosing wrong um, is that you won't be able to buy some good or service that you need in a week or a month. So a lot of cases you had millionaires get, you know, quarter million dollar, half a million dollar injections right to their net worth. While, you know, the typical American got a few thousand dollars in stimulus checks and a few thousand dollars in child tax credits. Um, and so basically you, you, you siphoned off everyone's savings and then you could redirect it in certain ways. What's up, Sats fans? Uh, my name is Sam Callahan. Welcome to Swan Signal. Uh, we got a great show planned for you guys today. Um, just a little bit first, uh, I want to bring up some of the exciting things we're doing at Swan. I work with Swan Private, which serves high net worth individuals and businesses. Uh, right now, we're pushing one of our products, the Swan IRA. We think it's a quality solution uh, to hold Bitcoin in a tax advantaged account. If you're looking at what's going on with GBTC and over at Grayscale, uh, we think we have a, a better product uh, that where you can hold the underlying Bitcoin in those tax advantaged accounts. So check out Swan IRA. Um, we also just launched an app. So check out the Swan app. Uh, you can download it from your app store. Uh, leave us a review. That always helps. Uh, there's great education on there from some of the guests that are on the show today, um, as well as an easy way to stack stats. You can smash by, you can set up Bitcoin savings plans. So check all that out. Um, I'm super excited to host this show. Uh, with two of my favorite Bitcoiners. So let's just get into it. i like to welcome to Swan Signal, the great Lynn Alden and Parker Lewis. What's up, guys? How are you guys doing today? Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah good, to be, good to be back on and good to be here with Lynn as well. I feel like um, it, it was either in May or June or sometime after the initial carnage began that we did one of these. Uh, so uh, it was Brady then, but good to have Sam taken, uh, you taking up the mantle and glad to be here. Yeah, man. I can't think of uh, two better guests to start uh, kick off my hosting duties with than you two. Uh, you know, you guys both write some great pieces of content, Lynn with your newsletter and then Parker with your Gradually Then Suddenly series. Um, so let's get into it. I'd like to, like to start with Parker uh, because, Parker, you wrote your, what, 18th piece in that series uh, recently, Bitcoin is not a hedge. And that's what I wanted to ask, because a lot of clients, a lot of my friends and family, they always bring up this question now. They say, you know, Bitcoin was supposed to be this inflation hedge. Uh, what happened? It totally failed. You see it in the media. Oh, Bitcoin failed as an inflation hedge. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I, I think that, well, first I would say that Bitcoin does meet the classical definition of an inflation hedge. Um, I think that you know the piece that I or, or the point that I make in the article that I published a few weeks ago was that it can also meet the the classical definition of an inflation hedge, but it is really the solution to monetary inflation, and that monetary inflation is a man-made phenomenon and that there's a lot of debate about what causes it or what doesn't cause it, but that in my view it all comes from the Federal Reserve who's really the only one who can create dollars and the Treasury can print dollars, but the Fed creates them. And that if, you know, it really centered around the fact that over the last 12 months, I got that question more than any other single question. If Bitcoin is an inflation hedge and there's inflation, why is Bitcoin going down, right? Everyone, consistently came back to that question. And as you know, when I first went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and I went down the, the Fed rabbit hole really in parallel and independently from that, I came to the conclusion that that Bitcoin was the solution to the dollar. That was that was my aha moment. And so in writing the piece, Bitcoin is not a hedge, I tried to lay out that framework of and, and kind of seeing it in my own circles where it would be like Bitcoiners trying to make the case that Bitcoin is money and sound money and that it's better than the dollar. And then when they would fail, it would be like, well, it's a hedge. Like, even if you don't right. accept that it's all of these things and that that realistically, it, Bitcoin is something. Um, and in my view, it's money and it's better money than the dollar and it will ultimately replace the dollar. And that people really can only exist on two ends of the spectrum. They'll exist somewhere in between for a period of time, 
But um, once they start to see Bitcoin as money, it is inevitable that they will ultimately see it as a replacement and that that it actually confuses a lot of people by describing it as a hedge. Whereas if someone's investing in, in gold or gold futures, they're really generally doing that to get more dollars. If they're investing in real estate as an inflation has, they're really doing it to get more dollars. And when people figure out that Bitcoin is a better form of money, they start to accumulate Bitcoin because they, they recognize that they're going to need it to buy food and to get gas. And those are two very different things. Right. You know, people start to use Bitcoin as a unit account. It becomes, uh, hey, how can I stack more Bitcoin? Not like a traditional hedge where you're buying, like, say, like you bring up oil futures contracts, how you're trying to hedge that uncertainty. Um, a little bit different with Bitcoin because it's like a more permanent solution. But you did bring up this idea of the Fed and the Fed printing dollars and how, you know, Bitcoin's price will fluctuate with the Fed turning those valves, you know, with their central planning, pulling liquidity in and out of the system. And I would like to go to the topic of liquidity because I think it's super important. And Stanley Druckenmiller had a quote saying earnings don't move the overall market. It's the Fed focus on the central banks and focus on liquidity. But there seems to be a debate about what's the best measure of liquidity. People look at M2 uh, money supply growth. People look at you know the dollar. People look at uh, net liquidity, looking at reserve, the reserve, uh, reverse repo rate, uh, Treasury general account, and the Fed's balance sheet. Um, Lynn, what, what is your preferred measure of liquidity? And, and how do you think about you know, where things stand today and maybe where things are going in terms of the liquidity picture? So I think we can partially separate domestic liquidity from international liquidity um, because those are not exactly the same thing. Um, and one thing I'll touch on about the whole inflation hedge thing before I continue answering that yeah. question is that uh, so part of my work is I track money supply growth quite a bit um, uh, in different countries. And one thing you generally see is that Bitcoin has been historically very correlated with money supply growth, um, especially when you take global M2, so global broad money supply and you translate it all back into dollars. And so the, the two big components there are, one, are a lot of countries printing money, and two, how is the dollar performing relative to those other big currencies, right? The euro, uh, you know, the, the UN, uh, yen, all these, all these kind of major currencies. And generally, when you, when you, that's rising very quickly, especially in rate of change terms. That's usually historically coinciding with the last three Bitcoin bull runs. And when that starts kind of rolling over and, and consolidating, uh, that's when Bitcoin has also historically kind of uh, consolidated. And inflation historically comes somewhat after money supply growth. It, it's basically a side effect that happens on a lag. And so when people, you know, the, the inflation that people saw taking shape in 2022 is, is in large part a result of actions that happened over 2020 and 2021. And so, for example, someone did buy Bitcoin well ahead of that if they were anticipating inflation if they, you know, saw that, you know, this kind of fiscal stimulus and money supply growth was happening, if they purchased Bitcoin, it did, you know, you know, protect them against the ravages of those inflation, just not perfectly timed with CPI that they see. Um, so that, that's one thing I'll kind of point out that because now we're in the 22, 2022 is the phase of the Fed fighting back on, on some of the things that happened in 2020, 2021. Um, and then going back to the idea of liquidity, basically, Domestic liquidity indicators, there's been a popular ratio that I've seen floated around and I've incorporated into my own analysis. I used to do similar um, uh, ways of adding it together, and I like this one a lot, so I incorporate it, which is basically you take the Fed balance sheet and then you also take the Treasury general account because they have um, a basically a cash account at the Fed, and any money in there is essentially dead money, right? So when that's growing, it's actually sucking money out of the system, and when that's shrinking, they're putting money back into the system. And so when you, when you kind of take those together and you add things like reverse repos, you can get a liquidity measure that is actually rather correlated uh, with risk assets in the United States. Um, and when you look at a global liquidity indicator, uh, in recent years, the dollar index is probably about as, as good as you're going to get or, or, dollar, or dollar denominated global money supply. Um, and that's because so many countries in the world have dollar denominated debts, right? The dollar is, is for the most part, the, the unit of account for the world. Um, that's changing somewhat over time, but, you know, most commodities are priced globally in dollars. Most international trade is denominated in dollars. And um, there's $13 trillion in, in dollar denominated debt outstanding in the world. A lot of developing countries, when they borrow from international sources, it's, it's done with dollars. And it's not even lent by Americans usually. It's usually Europeans, Japanese, Chinese. Um, you know, these, even though they're 
denominated in dollars, the, the lenders are all around the world because it's the global reserve currency. And so when you have the dollar strengthening relative to a basket of other currencies, essentially their liabilities are hardening uh, compared to their cash flows. And vice versa, when the dollar is weakening, um, essentially their debts are getting devalued relative to their other currency cash flows. And so when that, especially when that changes in a, in a very kind of short period of time, like when it strengthens or weakens very rapidly, that can cause a liquidity squeeze or a liquidity loosening. So those are kind of some of the things I look at either domestically or, or internationally when talking about liquidity, which is already kind of a, a jargony topic to begin with. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's important. And, um, you know, I like what you said in terms of, you know, Bitcoin's not going to be in line timing-wise with CPI because CPI is a lagging metric. Bitcoin, in a lot of ways, is a leading indicator. So in a lot of ways, it front ran that. But Parker, this leads right into some of the things that you talked about in your recent piece. You said, you know, from September 2019 to September 2021, the Fed increased the money supply by $4.7 trillion, doubling the amount of dollars in circulation. But it's almost unintuitive because you write how the world is still short dollars. And I think people would read that and be like, wait, they flooded the system with dollars, but the system is still short dollars. Can you maybe explain like how that is possible? Because I know it's, it's about this debt, right? Yeah, and I think as Lynn was talking about uh, cross-border dollar-denominated debt, I think Lynn quoted the number of $13 trillion. But if you look at the in, onshore, the, the U.S. system-wide, as the Fed reports it in the, in the Z1 report, uh, for the Financial Council of the United States, the total debt today is about $92 trillion. Um, and that is very vanilla debt. So fixed liability, fixed maturity. It includes um, consumer debt, mortgages, credit card, auto loans, um, non-financial corporate sector debt, state, local, federal debt, and financial sector debt. Um, and so if I went back all the way before the original financial crisis in 2008, um, there were about 52 trillion in dollar denominated debt liabilities. Again, not including uh, unfunded pension liabilities, not including derivatives, just the most vanilla debt that you could imagine. Uh, some fixed amount of debt that's owed at a future point in time. It was 52 to 53 trillion in, at the end of 2007. And there was only one trillion dollars. The Fed's balance, total balance sheet was, was one trillion dollars. And, and the, the, go ahead. Yeah, well, let's. Yo, Pete, can you throw up that chart Parker had? Maybe we could talk through it because I think that's kind of what he's talking about right now. Yeah, yeah. Hel helping people understand this dynamic that when the Fed comes oh. in and digitally creates dollars, they effectively credit more dollars to be in the bank's accounts and they buy some sort of debt instrument. And so around the financial crisis, they bought uh, treasuries and then expanded that to include treasuries and mortgage backed securities. Um, and then in 2017, they started to withdraw dollars from about $4.5 trillion down to that 3.8 figure. Um, and then following the repo market breaking in September of 2019, and then government shutting down the global economy and the printing that happened between uh, March of 2020 and May of 2020, and then in the subsequent year and a half, the Fed effectively created $5 trillion new dollars. But while they're creating those dollars, the, number, the amount of debt that exists still uh, by an order of magnitude now, previously orders of magnitude, exceeded uh, the number of dollars that existed. So as the Fed's introducing more dollars, they're, they're actually doing that because the credit system is starting to feed on itself. Uh, the system is starting to figure out that we're far more than a dollar short, and they're introducing more dollars for the, in my view, the express purpose of allowing existing debt levels to be sustained. Uh, such that the entire debt stack currently of $92 trillion from feeding on itself and collapsing. And so I think the important thing to recognize is that while they're creating all this money and while not everybody in the system is in debt at the individual level and not every company is in debt, the system as a whole is, is, is functionally insolvent. And that if they, if they didn't introduce these dollars, uh, that system collapses. But the, but the other consequence is that as they do it, everyone still needs to demand dollars that the, the in my view that the dollar denominated debt is what creates this high present demand for dollars and that while not every dollar of that 92 trillion is due tomorrow or in a week think about 30-year mortgages or 30-year treasuries but what happens is is that as the fed starts to withdraw dollars which is what they started and when i'm, I'm talking about base money that when they start to withdraw base money um, basically everybody starts to figure out that financial conditions are tightening 
And whether you have a debt that's owed in a year or five years or 10 years, uh, you start to try to accumulate dollars in forecasting out when you're going to need to repay those debts. And so kind of two sides of it, your most immediate question is that this is what the, the aggregate position looks like. So when they're introducing more dollars, there's still a bunch of people out there who've borrowed. Uh, and when I say they're short dollars, they owe dollars in the future that they don't have. Um, and, and then when they start to reverse out and take dollars out, it has an outsized impact because th when, they're, when they're introducing more dollars, the, the amount of debt remains the same. And when they take dollars out of the system, at least in, in, in the order of magnitude, the amount of debt doesn't magically go away. There's just fewer dollars to satisfy the debt and everybody starts to scramble. Uh, hmm. It essentially, when, the, when, they, when they start to withdraw debt for the system, it functionally creates a bank run um, from the weak, weakest in the chain. Right. And these huge liabilities, they create almost a present demand for dollars. And maybe that's why we saw a really strengthening dollar um, throughout 2021, which kind of wrecked all these other asset prices. Um, it's really I, fascinating. I would really say... I, I would really say it's like once at toward the end of 2021, they started to signal that they were going to raise interest rates. But really what I look at is they didn't start subtracting dollars out of the system until June of this year. And as, at the time when I wrote this article, I think that they had only withdrawn $350 billion relative to um, $8.9 But the, the key piece is that if every dollar is levered 10 to 1, uh, that it has an outsized impact. And um, and that is if, if you have all these liabilities and you start to reduce the the core building blocks of liquidity in the system, the dollar will strengthen uh, yeah. because gotcha. virtually everyone in the world, even everyone that's uh, responsibly long Bitcoin relies on the dollar economy and needs dollars to get very basic necessities met. Gotcha. Um you know, this kind of going like, P, if you could throw up the chart that Lynn shared this morning, I have to talk about this chart because it's ridiculous. It was published by the U.S. Treasury, you said. And we're talking about the, you know, sustainability of this, this debt system and how if they don't come back in and print money, you know, the, the way that the credit is right now, it likely collapse. But this is their projection, right? What, Lynn, what are we looking at here? And what, what was your initial takeaway when you saw this chart? So that was, that was published uh, last year by the U.S. Treasury Department, and it was it was so funny that I had to share it just because it, it, it's it's one of those like long term projections. It's like comical, yeah. uh, and basically their, their their whole point was showing that if there's no changes made to the current kind of fiscal situation in the United States, uh, that debt as a percentage of GDP will will balloon comically in the in the decades ahead with really no end in sight. And I guess the, a scary thing about that chart is that that assumes like no problems. That, that's that's kind of like no recessions, no wars, no X, Y, Z. That's just kind of like business as usual if nothing's fixed. Of course, it can't actually end up looking like that because you, you'd run out of base dollars to support that. You'd eventually would have to print the difference, and therefore you'd have a rapid growth in nominal GDP, which is which would mostly be the inflation component, and it would be a lot messier than that in, in real life, which is kind of why I, I, I kind of picked fun at them for publishing that chart. Yeah. Um, and one – and. You know, I've done actually similar analysis to what, what Parker just described, which is, you know, kind of looking at um, ratios of either money supply, like broad money supply to base money or total debt to base money. And so you can plot them over time. And we, we did hit a peak back in around the global financial crisis. It was something like 60 to 60 to one. You know, I think his chart showed 52 trillion to like, uh, you know, less than a trillion. To kind of do the numbers, it was like 60 or 65 to one ratio. And the last time we hit a super high ratio was actually 1929, like the early 1930s, before there was all sorts of like monetization then. And you kind of had this big echo happen ever since the global financial crisis, where we've been increasing the monetary base to try to catch up with the, with that broader setup. And the 13 trillion I mentioned was specifically the the offshore dollar dominated debt. So that that's like debt that'd be owed by entities, either governments or corporations, in places like Turkey, Brazil. China, uh, you know, countries on the world that, that use dollars. And the challenging thing here is that both, asset, both assets and liabilities in many cases are denominated in dollars. So in the United States, for example, you know, we have 100 or 200 trillion dollars in total assets. That includes real estate, stocks, um, bonds, things like that. 
even if you just factor out the debt, you know, you have, you have basically real estate and stocks, that's on a pretty small monetary base. And then you have all those liabilities. And, and so it's kind of this like, that's why you get these like liquidity crunches when they mm -hmm. try to do things like pull dollars out of the system, or if there's any sort of shock to income while all of these, you know, assets and liabilities are highly levered compared to the monetary base. And you see a similar effect when you look globally. And essentially what we're seeing now with that, that chart you brought up is just that right now the U.S. is on this very unsustainable fiscal path where they're running very, very large deficits. And historically, the way you, you deal with that is you kind of monetize it. If you're an emerging market and you, you're, you're, you owe debt that you can't print, like if you're Argentina and you owe dollars, you, you just kind of have to default or, or ask for like a restructuring. Whereas if the liabilities are in your own currency, like if you're America with dollars, if, if you're uh, Japan with yen, you essentially print the difference, uh, but that leads to, to inflation. You're inflating away part of the debt. Um, and right now they're kind of in that counter push where they're kind of trying to get the wheels back on the cart. They're kind of trying to say, you know, this is sustainable. We're going to get back to like financial discipline. Um, and it's one of those things. If, if you do the math and you do somehow conclude that they can do it, if you think, okay, they can return to structurally positive real yields, um, they can they can get this under control. They're going to do all sorts of fiscal adjustments to get the debt under control. They're going to start paying it down. Then that's a good case to buy and own dollars long term. Uh, on the other hand, if you do the math and you kind of realize that this is uh, almost certainly unsustainable and that almost any attempts that they try to change the system will probably cause a problem elsewhere in the system and, and continue the kind of the perpetual debt increase and more rounds of quantitative easing and long stretches of negative real yields on all these various bank accounts and debt instruments, then that's a case to buy, you know, like sound money. You know, historically that could have been gold. Uh, of course, this is a Bitcoin show. You know, Bitcoin is, is uh, you know, the fastest horse in town, better in many ways compared to gold. Uh, and so essentially that's kind of the case to buy those harder monies uh, if you view them as, as more sound than what you're probably going to get with the U.S. financial system, let alone when you do kind of a similar analysis on other countries around the world and, and their, their debt issues. Right. And when you look at it, you know, a lot of ways, the math just doesn't make sense, which leads you to believe that they will resort to printing. And then you have inflation, uh, which causes all kinds of problems, uh, you know, that Parker goes into in his piece. But, you know, tomorrow is FOMC day, which is always one of my favorite days because it's hilarious to me that everyone just stops what they're doing and these central planners get into a room and decide the price of money for the entire global economy. Uh, but moving on from that point, um, you know, the Fed is on one of its fastest hiking cycles in its entire history, Parker. And you said that the Fed policy is to create economic chaos is what you said, which I loved. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate further on that point, because I think it's really important. Well, um, first, in honor of FOMC Day, I don't know if there's like a signal that Lynn is sending by, I think, wearing a purple shirt. Um, <laughs> But um, that was one of the jokes that went around that like Yellen wore like a purple shirt, you know, during the, you know, like, did that have a signal of like, you know, not red and blue, but it, it's just such a joke. Everyone literally, they have, you know, machines that, that parse the, the difference in like the, 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 the precise language that comes out from the minutes. And then they have algos that trade the fact that, uh, it, it, is, it is a damning state of affair of just how many people stop everything because yeah. they have to, right? Like, and it, it's, it's, it's not to any fault. It's that, you know, I don't know if it was the comment that you made about Druckenmiller. It's all what the Fed does, right? Everything yeah. becomes correlated to that. Uh, and it is, it, is kinda, it's, it is kind of comical, but it is a reality that we all have to suffer through at the same time. So I did just want to uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. note that Lynn, Lynn shirt might you know, yeah, suggest Lynn. that uh, it, might be, it might be a tea leaf that we need to pay attention to. Purple, um, she might, purple for she, 25 basis points. Yeah, yeah, 25 basis points. Split the difference. Um, you know, one of the things that, that in the piece I talk about is, and, and kind of coming back to this idea of, you know, whether Bitcoin's an inflation hedge or not, is that I think that if, if any Bitcoiner is watching this show and if they're honest with themselves, that they will accept that no fewer than one out of 100 people in the world understand Bitcoin the way that they do, or no fewer than, or no more than like one, I would probably say one in a thousand, like actually intuitively seeing why there could possibly be a scenario of Bitcoin out competing the dollar and becoming the form of money that, that replaces 
the dollar permanently. And if that's the case, then if one out of a thousand people actually fundamentally get it, how could 999 people just suddenly figure it out overnight? Because a Bitcoiner generally knows all the work that it was required to like actually see Bitcoin as money. Um, that, that that is kind of core to this overarching theme that I was presenting of like, you know, understanding Bitcoin and many people came to understand Bitcoin because they were paying attention and saw that the Fed created $3 trillion between March of 2020. That, that helped them understand Bitcoin, that this is a reality and it's a problem. Um, but that when I think about the, the say, because that I always point to that period because it happened very quickly. Like the other times when the Fed was printing money was just as problematic in my mind. But from March of 2020 to May of 2020, they printed $3 trillion or technically digitally created $3 trillion via QE in a 13 week period. Um, not only was it the gr most amount of money that they had ever created um, in that period, but it was also the quickest. Um, post financial crisis, they were at the maximum creating 85 billion a month for several months. And in a single week, they pr produced 586 billion. So that was that was the highest single week that uh, that they they did QE in that March uh, of 2020 to May of 2020. A lot of people start to look at that and they think about it arithmetically, where like oh, and and this is specifically you know modern monetary theorists or anybody else that's not serious about life, um, where they say hey the Fed is creating money, and everything's just going to cost more in dollars, and that's okay because we all then have more dollars to buy more things. And that only exists in this vacuum academic world that doesn't coexist with the real world. But that what, what actually happens when they, they print all this money is that price signals and prices and the way that money is distributed does not happen radically. Um, in, in a modern monetary theorist world, they might want people to just be able to helicopter drop the proportional amount of money you know, consistent with the way that everyone had it or real, realistically, they'd probably want to give more people or less, you know, kind of pick and choose. But, but what happens practically is the Fed puts money in the system to, to, to allow credit to be sustained. In the last episode, they had to put it in a lot more places to keep the boat afloat. But that what then happens is relative price signals change unpredictably. Um, typically, because things that are more dependent on credit get disproportionately impacted like housing and autos. But the reality is that price levels don't just change like everything costing 10% more and the relationship between what a house costs and a car costs remain the same. That just isn't how it practically happens. And that one way I described it in one of my prior pieces is that it's not just moving the goalpost when they print money or subtract money. It's like building the entire economic system on a 1980 style waterbed and then <laughs> shifting the goalposts that the entire foundation of the system changes. It's like no one can find an equilibrium because the whole because the actual economic system and structure has permanently changed. And that what what happens at a more fundamental level is the, the function of printing money and subtracting money. It permanently impairs the the monetary instrument, the dollar's ability to, to coordinate trade effectively. And that 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 uh, that mechanism, the dollar impairs and impairs and impairs ultimately to a point where uh, it's no longer functional at all. And that's when hyperinflation happens that I think most people assume that hyperinflation happens because they just printed too much money. Um, but in reality, it's the printing of money that impairs the ability of humans to trade. And, and what that translates to is a, an impairment of the ability to deliver real goods and services that you need on a daily basis that actually have to be produced on a marginal basis because there is a fundamental difference between an existing asset base that exists like that home existed versus I need to build a new home and I need to coordinate all of the inputs to a home or I need to coordinate all of the inputs to an oil well or to a gas well or to a pipeline, that there are a number of marginal things that you need to consume every day that need to be delivered every day in order for us to stay in our current standard of living. And the printing of money functionally impairs that and it degrades 
over time, and then it ultimately fails to work. That's what's happened, in my view, in every instance historically of hyperinflation, and it will ultimately happen in the cases that it, it, we're in the, we're in the middle innings of it, of the dollar, um, and that eventually the, the currency itself fails, and, and failing means the inability to coordinate trade, and that's the path that we're on. And so when I described it as creating economic chaos, it is, it is really at its most basic level um, mucking up the system or impairing the instrument that coordinates trade, and we're on this very precarious path where um, it will no longer work at some point in time once a critical mass of humans figure out just exactly what's happening. Another, another challenge with uh, printing money is that it's not distributed back to everyone equally, or uh, it's basically dispersed, picking winners or losers based on policymaker decisions. And obviously in different eras, that can, that can favor different groups. It also generally favors debtors over savers because more money is being created, but all the debts are still denominated in the prior unit. Um, and you know, one way to quantify it is that something like six trillion, and it's gone down a little bit, but like something like six trillion new broad money uh, was created uh, since the start of 2020. Uh, and so it's not just you know bank reserves; it's actually you know it's being created, but then it was also dispersed out into the broad money supply due to uh, you know just various fiscal programs. And if you divide that by the number of households in the United States. Uh, it's about 130 million households. So if you do the math, it's something like $46,000 per household. Wow. And so if you're if you're a household and you kind of if you go back and say, okay, how much did I get from the government? You add up the stimulus checks, you add up child tax credits, things like that. Does it come anywhere near 46,000? And and of course the answer is no. And there were on the other hand, you know, PPP loans. Everyone talks about the stimulus checks. I think that PPP loans are under talked about because. You know, businesses could apply for quarter million dollar, million dollar, you know, two million dollar. I forget the exact upper limit. It was like a million or two. You could you could apply for these massive loans that then get turned into grants. They just get forgiven, and you had to sign up to say, okay, I'm going to pay my employees. Uh, this is necessary to continue operations. But a lot of businesses got them. You know, they were kind of structured on the idea of like a, an independent restaurant. You know, they're told to shut down, but we don't want them to go out of business, so we're going to give them a grant to, to keep going. And a few people would criticize that specific application, but when you actually look at what happened, there was like law firms and like investment firms. They were like, yeah, yeah, we need the money to like pay our employees, and they're, they didn't actually have, they didn't lose profits. And so all that money just goes straight to the owner's bottom line, because he's like, oh yeah, I, play, I paid that to the employees, but that just means that the income that they got just got to go up to them. Uh, and so a lot of cases you had millionaires get, you know, quarter million dollar, half a million dollar injections right to their net worth while, you know, the typical American got a few thousand dollars in stimulus checks and a few thousand dollars in child tax credits. Um, and so basically you, you, you siphoned off everyone's savings and then you could redirect it in certain ways. A, a similar thing happened during the global financial crisis where they built out banks, but they didn't bail out homeowners to, to nearly the same degree. Yeah. And you know, even like if you have liquidity in the moment where no one else has liquidity, like if, if there's if everything's like selling off due to fire sell prices and the dollar soaring and, and you know things are getting crushed, and you give out liquidity to key institutions that can go and like you know basically buy things or, or make really good loans and things like that, then they they come out of that stronger than ones that weren't given that sort of lifeline. Um, in addition, you know, during during the during the pandemic, I mean, if you let's say you were a gigantic restaurant corporation, you have access to public capital markets. The Fed was in there keeping the bond market liquid, right? They were literally buying corporate bonds. They were keeping the bond market liquid. Whereas if you were a small restaurant, you know, an individual like you know, just family run restaurant, you're trying to get credit and trying to you know get liquidity, keep going in that environment. A lot of banks would just say no, and the Fed just doesn't have the logistics to go around and help every mom and pop restaurant out there. It, it kind of inherently favors these these larger entities, and so basically by having a, a public ledger that can then be you know drained and, and directed in certain ways, you know that that's it's easy to either purposely or accidentally direct it towards people that are already at, near the top of the system. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was I was just going to add that um, I think that keying in on that point is really important because another kind of fundamental way that I think about this is. If there is a scenario where a financial crisis could occur or would occur, and in the Fed system 
it's always an inevitability because of the degree of system leverage. That what's functionally happening if the Fed were to do nothing is that it's evidence of an imbalance existing in the economic structure and that the market is adjusting to eliminate imbalance. And that what the Fed essentially steps in to do is to print money to allow that imbalance that what the market was attempting to eliminate to allow it to be sustained. And then it has the consequence of exacerbating it. And so if you have this economic structure that has an imbalance and the market is otherwise correcting for it, but that the Fed is the thing that's working in opposition to it, that one way I think about it is like imbalance means that the system is not functioning well and that the imbalance needs to be eliminated, but that it's kind of like a, a pinball machine that if you have a system of imbalance and you, you, you inject a little bit of money into the system, it really doesn't matter where, where it goes. It's going to find its way back into that trap. And that, that trap is all the mass, like, because everyone has observed this massive centralizing force of the economic structure. And we can talk about the cantillionaires and the cantillon effect. But if you think about it, it's like if you give somebody money, even if it's a PP loan to the, the person who is supposed to have it, and then they go spend their money at Amazon who gets 1% credit because the Fed's manipulating the cost of capital or Apple or Whole Foods, is if that money doesn't continue to circulate in a sustainable way, in a balanced way, uh, it always just ends up in a centralizing force where the large get larger and fewer people get um, kind of uh, disenfranchised. And, and it's actually the market that's trying to eliminate the imbalance to, to allow those imbalances to, 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 to correct. And the Fed consistently comes in injects more money, continues to prop up these large interests, and then that, that begets the same thing again. It just yeah. it, it, it causes further consolidation because it further manipulates the cost of capital lower when, when it otherwise would, would uh, reset to a more market clearing level. Gotcha. Yeah, it creates all these distortions. You know, every time they manipulate the money supply, it creates all these imbalances. I the PPP loans were something else too. They were just riddled with fraud because they were government guaranteed, right? And so all these uh, firms took advantage of that, and it was completely forgiven. And how wasteful is that? What a massive misallocation of capital. Um, and there was no gar- there was no guidelines. There was no oversight of what they did with those loans at all. And then they were completely forgiven. So, you know, every time a crisis happens, it just seems like the policies um, that these policymakers do in reaction to the crises just become more and more extreme, um, both in size and then the programs themselves. Um, yeah, I think one other thing that, that Lynn touched on, which I think is important for people to observe, is uh, she talked about purchasing corporate debt, Right. Um, and I think if, if, if we go back and track this evolution, before the great financial crisis of 2008, Fed would buy treasuries. During the, during the financial crisis and the period after, they started buying mortgage-backed back securities. And there were a lot of people in the Fed at that time that were incredibly uncomfortable with the idea of allocating what they perceived to be advantaging the housing market over other sectors of the economy. Uh, one Fed president, I think it was uh, Fisher from Dallas, equated it to his o- operating a hedge fund. Then when we fast forward to, to 2020, they basically had to buy every form of credit they possibly could. Corporate bonds, they bought, they bought um, muni bonds. They, I believe, also had instruments to buy money market funds, maybe that were invested in mortgages, or sorry, uh, so, uh, muni bonds. But this idea that like, they had to go buy all the different types of credit where those markets became dysfunctional. So yeah. it was essentially like, if you, if you track the evolution, it was like first treasuries, then it was treasuries and MBS, then it was treasuries, MBS, corporate bonds, muni bonds, money market. You know, you have to plug the ship because there's so many places that it's leaking. And, and that will only, like the next time it happens, it's like, the, I'm sure that they're doing work right now to be like, the, okay, if, we, if we've had to have this progression, how are we going to get the money into the points of the system that are that are going to break because it's going to be increasingly more and more of those but that's also just a demonstration that the that yeah. the system itself is structurally broken yellen yellen floated the idea of buying stocks too during that time period which was you know the next progression there logical progression there um let's let's get back to inflation a little bit because 
that's what seems to be the end game here, right? They can either choose to print the difference uh, when we look at the debt and how uns unsustainable it is, and that will likely create more structural inflation over time, especially if they have to run these massive fiscal deficits. Now, Lynn, I just I love this tweet you did a couple months ago where you just asked, imagine you live in a developing country with an ongoing severe currency devaluation problem. You want to sell your existing home, hold it in some stable liquid value, and then probably buy a different home in two years. What do you hold it in? And I know, I know that you have some family and friends in Egypt that are kind of going through this right now. And so when, you, when you're thinking about that, maybe you can think about some of the replies that came from that tweet, but what are people supposed to do to protect themselves from this stuff? Yeah, I put that as a thought experiment because so many people in developed countries don't think about money that often. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, whereas people in developing countries have to think about it more specifically. And so a lot of people, when I asked that, I was basically, you know, that was based on, as you put out, like I have family and friends in Egypt and, and for example, some of them were trying to sell a multifamily property, which is, it has some logistics to it because they're going to get dispersed and not all going to be able to buy a home at the same time. And they want to figure out, you know, they want to be able to save that in a liquid form. And at the time, some of them were talking about saving it in Egyptian bonds. And this was, this was before the big currency crisis happened. I was like, you're going to, you're going to do what? You're going to put them all in like <laughs> Egyptian bonds. Like literally, you know, you could get wiped out. Yeah. Um, and so we were kind of exploring alternatives. And so it sparked the question months later, that I asked on Twitter, and a lot of people responded, and they just said, like, I would hold dollars. So then I was like, well, where specifically are you going to hold dollars? Because, for example, you know, there are periods where time where if you hold dollars in a Lebanese bank or an Argentinian bank in one of these, these places, they just get taken from you. The, the bank, you know, the government or the bank says, okay, well, those are not your dollars anymore. We're going to give you a similar amount of pesos, you know, to, to buy them from you at, at a, you know, the official exchange rate, which is not the real exchange rate. And then you just continue getting inflated away. Um, an alternative is some people turn to stable coins. Obviously, those have counterparty risk as well. The counterparty is outside of the country. So if anything, it's, it's safer than, say, if you're sticking them in an Argentinian bank. But it's still obviously not ideal. You can, you can do physical dollars. You can do gold. There's really no clean solution uh, historically for people in this environment. And then Bitcoin is obviously a good solution, but it's, it's still small and volatile. And so they have to incorporate that into their analysis. It's, it's still a much smaller, more nation as, asset. Um, and it shows essentially that the world has a money problem, which remains unresolved unless or until we see more of an outcome uh, from this. Yeah. And it's just something that people in, in the United States and Europe and Japan just rarely have to think about. And, you know, this, this was, you know, around the margins, people that are paying attention think about it because, you know, cash, cash savings are, you know, the interest rates are below the inflation rates. Um, uh, same thing for most government bonds. Um, there's even that period of, of negative nominal bonds that was, that was around the world in kind of that disinflationary bubble. So people around the margins are kind of pointed in that, um, but people in, in a lot of developing countries experience it in a more like in their face way. We also see, for example, like in Nigeria, you know, they're, they're, they launched their central bank digital currency. It had very, very poor adoption, something like sub 1% adoption after the first year. And now they're doing things like, you know, tightening how much cash you can withdraw from an ATM. Um, they've already severed crypto exchanges from their banking system. So it's, it's very hard to get uh, money inflows, you know, into things like Bitcoin, stable coins, or, you know, whatever kind of thing they want to buy. Um, and... So now there's kind of like this peer-to-peer -peer market where they pay a premium in order to get Bitcoin, right? And it's, it's like, if you talk to a Nigerian, it's, it's, it's like if you talk to an American, a lot of people be like, yeah, like Bitcoin's the solution in search for a problem. Like, I don't see why people need Bitcoin. Whereas if you talk to someone in Argentina or Nigeria or Turkey or Lebanon, and they say, like, why are things like Bitcoin or stable coins or whatever useful, you know, it's, you get an obvious answer because it's, they actually have this problem like every day yeah. and it's, it's staring them in the face. Yeah, Nigeria has a really high Bitcoin adoption rate and it's because they understand it, right? And, and that goes back to Parker, your piece, man. Like it's, it's so volatile and people are looking for a solution and it's just because they don't realize that Bitcoin is the solution. And it just it reminds me of Jamie Dimon at Davos recently. He says, yeah, really, but how do you know it's going to stop at 21 million? And that's kind of the key question, right? Like, why is it so important to understand 21 million fixed supply, Parker? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I, I was actually thinking about writing, not a piece, graphic and suddenly piece, but just, um, you know, something for Jamie Diamond, uh, where the one, one thing, one observation I had of that is that implicitly what he said is that it is important, right? Because... I don't think that it's going to stop at 21 million. So you're saying if it did, then that would be of interest. Um, so let's let's first agree there. Yeah. And then, um, you know, part of how he described it was, how do you know it's going to end there? Where like when they like almost like when it gets to 21, the clock's just going to keep running and another Bitcoin, and another Bitcoin. And it's this idea that I think that most people have where it's like this running clock of, you know, something linear and not realizing. And I think I've been thinking about the right way to frame this, but it's that the 21 is enforced right now. And that if people actually understand the 6.25 Bitcoin that are issued in every block, that we wouldn't have to wait when, we, when Bitcoiners talk about how, and I think I've even mentioned in the piece that, the last Bitcoin, the last fra small fraction of a Bitcoin will be mined in 2138. That that we would know in the next 10 minutes if the 21 million cap could be exceeded. And that is what is not intuitive to most people or that, no, that, that most people don't know. Certainly Jamie Dimon doesn't because the way that he described it was when we get to 21 million, how do we know it's not going to be 21 million and one? Well, the real answer is that in the next block that was solved, if it was seven Bitcoin issued rather than 6.25 and the network accepted it as valid, then something's broken. We don't have to wait to 2138 to know. We know every 10 minutes either the fixed supply is being enforced or it's not. Um, but it comes back to the point that it's like most people don't do not even understand that, that the, that the signal is fixed supply or not and is it credible. And first you have to get there and then you have to start to develop a framework to understand why. And I think the point that you're you're kind of making here is that in, in many cases, it's just real world experience that if something is, you know, it's, it's fight or flight. If something is front and center and your Argentine pesos or um, your, your local currency in Zimbabwe, it, it, or your Lebanon, Lebanese, I don't know if it's a, a pound, Lebanese pound, if that is changing week to week and percentage basis is where you're having to decide what do I do right now because the consequence is next week it's not going to purchase me anything, then you're going to react based on common sense rather than you know reason and logic. But the common sense is just as valuable and the real world experience is in many cases um, – more valuable to, to you than kind of the academic rigor or the intentional intellectual thought, but that it all does come down to that and that you cannot just arrive at that point magically. It's not just like some one, one, you know, sitting down for 60 minutes and thinking about it. Um, but that, that everyone really does have to either through lived experience or through some sort of primary education um, has to get to, to seeing Bitcoin as money um, some people might get there from reading the Bitcoin standard or the bullish case for Bitcoin or American the Bitcoin dream, um, inventing Bitcoin. Others will do it because their currency is falling apart and it's A or B. And the difference in choosing wrong um, is that you won't be able to buy some good or service that you need in a week or a month rather than thinking out a year or five years or 10 years. And a lot of us have in, in the United States and the developed world, as Lynn was saying, have this luxury of, I think I, our problem is just as big. It's just not as present, but it's as big as if not larger because we have a, sta a higher standard of living. We have more to lose, essentially, uh, because if you take if you took somebody in the United States that had all the luxuries that we have and you and you then had them live in the in the way of a developing world, like having something and, and losing it. It is a lot more painful than, than going in the opposite direction. And so I think it's that the, the problem is just as big. It's just not as present. And so people feel like they have more time. Um, but that for, for anybody in the United States or anybody in Nigeria or anybody in Argentina, the problem is the same. We're just at a different point on the curve. And the way that we might come to understand Bitcoin is my, maybe through a book rather than through a live, real live world experience. Yeah, I mean, it, the, when you understand the 21 million, 
and Bitcoin credibly enforces that 21 million, it becomes such a certain thing, right? And that certainty is what you've been talking about in terms of what money needs to have in order to coordinate trade that the dollar doesn't have and fiat doesn't have. There's a lot more uncertainty around those fiat currencies and the monetary policies uh, with them. So, you know, where are people going to gravitate towards the more certain monetary policy that they can trust because it's trustless, right? Um, and so let's 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 finish on Bitcoin. We got a little bit more time left here. And uh, 2023, I mean, it's been on a tear. It's been it's been rolling, and I think it maybe caught some people by surprise. It's up almost 40 percent uh, year to date. Um, you know, Lynn, maybe I could get your opinion here. A lot of people are calling this, hey, it's a bull trap. They're looking at economic indicators, and a lot of it's looking like maybe a recession around the corner. They're saying, hey, this isn't going to last. But then at the same time, this is how the beginning of bull markets happen, where it climbs a wall of worry, and there's a lot of disbelief. How are you reading it? Uh, so I, th- I think it's a good start. I mean, historically, Bitcoin bottoms have been a process. That's true for a lot of other asset classes as well. Um, and if you go back to actually the, the earlier part of the discussion, we talked about liquidity, right? So liquidity conditions all throughout 2022 were worsening based on various ways of measuring it that I talked about before until we got to around quarter four. Um, at that point, the Treasury General Account was drawing down, which was actually pushing liquidity back into the market and offsetting some of the Fed quantitative tightening. Uh, basically, more of that monetary base was kind of out into the world rather than locked away. Um, and so it's kind of this like temporary offset. And now with the debt ceiling, um, they're unable to issue new debt. And so what, what historically happens is some of the measures they take to avoid defaulting until that's sorted out is that they empty out their cash account. It's kind of like if you lost your income, but you had some savings and you, you still pay your bills for a few more months. That's kind of what the Treasury is doing right now. And that's actually ironically good for market liquidity in the moment that it's happening. And so starting in Q to 4, you had like a, you know, a stabilization um, and then an improvement in liquidity conditions, at least temporarily. And I think, prob- you know, you started to see like gold and other assets kind of start rallying in quarter four. And I think you probably would have seen Bitcoin do something similarly, if not for the industry specific blow up that happened, uh, you know, FTX, Alameda. Um, so I think I think some of what we saw in January is kind of like a, a delayed, you know, function to kind of play catch up a little bit now that we're seeing a little bit more just you know boringness in the industry uh, it's able to it's able to catch some of that liquidity and start recovering um, I do have some concerns around the second half of the year because once they resolve the debt ceiling you're gonna see the Treasury almost certainly try to uh, suck back liquidity out of the market to fill back up its Treasury account and if the Fed is still withdrawing liquidity at that time you could have a rapid decrease in liquidity so you could get negative retests you could get you know consolidations corrections um, but it's unclear how this is going to play out. It's possible that the Fed will not even be able to still be quantitative tightening at that time. It's possible that the Treasury will try to draw up very slowly. Uh, we don't know exactly when or how the debt ceiling is going to be resolved. So a lot of this is guessing game, and it's hard to say if, if Bitcoin you know, rallies and then corrects from whatever level it rallied to. It might not correct back down to where it is now, it, or, or it could, right? So uh, I think basically traders, you know, you know, the, Professional traders are going to try to, you know, get what they can out of it. But I think for the vast majority of people, I would just point to that it's it's by most metrics a, a kind of a deep value zone based on a lot of different metrics. I think it's attractive with a three to five year perspective. If you monitor the fundamentals of the network, if you if you think the network's healthy, if you think um, all the aspects are still working as intended, if you don't see that there's any sort of competitors that are anywhere near close to what Bitcoin offers, then I think it's a strong buy. And I would just caution that, you know, I do think that there, that there is potentially a period of turbulence, you know, in the second half of this year, once, once you know, some of this, this debt ceiling stuff's resolved. I think, I think we, we still are not out of the woods yet there. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Parker, what about you, man? How are you reading things? Um, I, I align with Lynn on all of that. I'd say that um, I think that the Fed is the 800-pound gorilla in the room and that uh, I would proceed that with saying that even in my view, if the Fed did not print another dollar, um, Bitcoin replaces the dollar. Um, that that Bitcoin is not dependent on the Fed printing money. I have a, a fundamental reason why I will say that it is a certainty that they will have to do that. Um, but that uh, that 
Bitcoin does not depend on it because um, I don't want my comments to be misinterpreted that way. Okay. But that the Fed is the 800 pound gorilla. And if they are withdrawing money, base money from the system, and I think Lynn puts out a good point. Um, that was part of the rabbit hole that I went down with the Fed of like understanding how the, the treasury account impacts uh, the cash that's actually in the banking system because it does impact like working, you know, I kind of think about it as if, if the Fed is taking money out of the system and then there's working capital going from the banking system to the treasury and from the treasury to the banking system, but the Fed is dictating the total supply of dollars. So long as they are doing that, everybody is swimming upstream because, you know, whether things change for a month or two, it is a one-way direction and it will find its way to the market. And so I just tell people to be cautious. Um, I'm not convinced that we're out of the neck of the woods. I also align with with Lynn's view that like we don't know it might it might recover to 30, 40k and then have a snap down. I do think there is a liquidity crisis that will happen in the dollar market and Bitcoin will go down. It's impossible to know when it happens um, and where Bitcoin will be when it does. Um, but that people still need dollars to live and to buy groceries and to buy gas and like. I, I expect inflation to continue to, to to rise because I don't think that whatever the Fed's doing is going to deliver more um, oil to the market or more gas, and they can destroy as much um, demand as they want. But but the demand for those things is highly; those goods are highly inelastic. People need them to survive. And so, um, what I would say is, I always psychologically, and this is not just a, a statement. Like I psychologically prepare myself uh, for Bitcoin going down 50% at a given notice. So yeah. like March 12, 2020, 8,000 to 4,000, who knows, maybe it's Bitcoin's at 20,000 and it goes to 10 or 40,000 and it goes to 20 or 30 and 15. I just always psychologically harden myself and prepare for the moment that there is a dollar liquidity crisis because if you think about that 92 trillion of, of debt stack to 8.6, it's about 8.6 trillion. If So long as that is declining, it is, it is creating a run on a bank or a credit market somewhere, and, and you need to be very cautious. So it's always hold dry powder, but do be exposed to Bitcoin, but you know, kind of keep your head on a swivel and, um, and, and eyes wide open uh, because, because the Fed is, is, you know, everything will become correlated to the dollar. And so long as dollars are becoming more scarce for a temporal period of time, uh, everyone's going to need to source liquidity, especially those who, who are insolvent. Right. Yeah. I mean, th I think both you guys had a lot of wisdom there and to mentally prepare yourself for all probabilities um, is super important just to uh, make sure that you don't panic and make emotional decisions at the wrong times. Uh, just expect the unexpected. Um, I think those are all great advice and great insights. So, you know, we're reaching the end of our time. I want to thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Um, where can people find you? Maybe start with Parker. Parker, I know you do a lot of community work. And um, I think there's like a Bitcoin takeover Austin coming up, right? So, um, yeah. yeah, man. So w where can people find you uh, to read your stuff? And then also congratulations on the new appointment to the board at Unchained. That's awesome stuff. So uh, where can people find you, man? Yeah, I really appreciate that. So you can find me on Twitter, Parker A. Lewis. Um, all my writing going forward will be on my ghost page, which is bitcoiner.ghost.io. Um, it will also be housed on the Unchained website too. Um, and then um, outside of that, you can find me at the Bitcoin Commons. So uh, either the Bitcoin Commons or generally at a meetup in Texas. Um, I help co-organize the, the Houston Bitcoin meetup as well. But if you're ever through Austin, come into the Bitcoin Commons. We are doing a Bitcoin takeover during South by Southwest. Um, once again, the South by Southwest track is, is light on Bitcoin. I think they've got one or two panels and they're not really on Bitcoin. Uh, in my view, if it's a, if it's in part of technology conference, Bitcoin should be the most important thing there. And we'd probably have done this anyways, but if you're interested in coming to the, uh, the Bitcoin takeover, it's a full day of programming. We've got 20 speakers. Uh, you can go to the Bitcoin commons handle on Twitter at Bitcoin commons, um, or go to bitcoincommons.com and you can purchase a ticket, but it's March 17th in Austin. Uh, we'll have a bunch of Bitcoiners there. It'll be the lead up to, uh, to the Bitcoin conference in May. Sounds fun. What about you, Lynn? Where can people find you? I'm at lynndalton.com. People can check out my works there. I do a lot of writing. I'm also on Twitter at lynndaltoncontact. 
I've been exploring uh, Noster uh, and some of these yeah. other, other areas lately. Um, and yeah, just find my work wherever it's online. Yeah, uh, that's the best bargain uh, in the investment world, in my opinion. I, I just love your pieces, Lynn. You help so much. So does my dad, by the way. He Bye, really a bit, is a big fan of yours. Um, so anyway, thanks so much, guys. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day, and I hope to have you guys back on soon. Wow, that was a fantastic episode. I enjoyed that conversation so much. Um, whenever I talk to Lynn and Parker, I just am left with so many things to think about because they have such fantastic insights. Um, if you like this, uh, make sure you subscribe uh, to the Swan Bitcoin channel so that you get notifications so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. Um, we have some great shows lined up for you coming up over the next couple months. So you're, you're not going to want to miss it. So if you're listening on a podcast or on YouTube, make sure you like it. Make sure you subscribe it. Uh, we really appreciate the support. And I'll see you next week.